thanks everybody for joining. I appreciate you taking a little time. I know that everybody's life's a little bit upside down here of late over the past few weeks. So uh, I do appreciate uh, you fitting this in. Uh, as Lori said, um, my role here is I'm in charge of all of our consulting services. So I have a team of engineers that span all the different disciplines from manufacturing to civil to uh, MEP, architecture, you name it, and our software development team. Um, and basically, for the last 30 years or so, I've been involved in consulting with clients in a number of different ways on process improvement strategies. So it's the stuff that gets me really fired up. I get very passionate about it. So any chance I get to share where my head is at and the things that are important to me with other people that think about the same things, uh, I get pretty excited about that. So uh, forgive me if I seem really passionate about some of the topics we're going to cover today. All right, so I'm going to start off maybe with a couple of quotes here, um, and it really comes down to kind of the age of disruption that we're in. Um, some of these slides I created a few months ago, and I certainly believed in the age of disruption that we had then, um, but now more so than ever, many of you are probably logging in from home, trying to figure out how to work with your companies remotely and all of your vendors, contractors, and suppliers and that kind of thing. So it's even more difficult and more important that we figure out ways to automate processes when we're so uh, separated and, and away from each other. Um, this quote from Bill Taylor, I truly believe in and like to share as much as I can. Uh, the most successful organizations don't just outperform the rivals, they redefine the rules of the competition, change the game up, all right? I'll give you a couple of examples, a few examples here. And I guess this kind of comes back to testimonial of this new age that we're in, in terms of how people are doing business today. World's largest taxi company doesn't have any taxis, right? You're probably thinking to yourself, who would that be? And sooner or later, you're probably going to arrive at the idea that that's Uber, right? They don't own any cars at all. They're the biggest taxi company in the planet world's largest provider of accommodations, they don't own any hotels or real estate. Right? Again, you're racking your brain and it probably doesn't take long to realize that's Airbnb and some of the competitors now to Airbnb. World's largest movie house, they don't own any theaters. Any guesses? You probably figured out that might be Netflix, right? So my point there is, Things aren't the same as they used to be 10 years ago, five years ago, even a couple of years ago. In a lot of different cases, people came up with a way to change the game in their favor, redefining the rules. All right. <clears throat> so to stay ahead of your competition in this whole age of disruption, you really can't be okay doing things the way you've been doing them. You've got to figure out a way to stand out from the crowd. And process automation offers a number of different ways that you can do that. Okay. One last quote here. Um, a lousy process will consume as many hours as the as, as many as 10 times as many as hours as the work itself requires. Now, again, this is a quote from someone who did a pretty good job of changing the game for decades in terms of productivity for customers, Mr. Bill Gates. So it, it all goes to, to the point that I'm trying to make in that if you want to set yourself apart, you've got to try something new. You've got to invest and automate different workflows within your process that are dragging the company down, that are requiring a lot of manual interaction today. That's where we're going to focus our time in this presentation. Okay? So, a little quiz, make you think about this for just a second. Um, I like to study research out there and find out what engineers, architects, project managers feel, you know, is, is important to them. And I read a study that asked the question of 300 different engineers. And the question was simple. 
If you looked at your average day in a given hour, how much time are you productive? How much time do you spend actually doing the things that you were hired to do? So as you're all sitting there, I'm pretty sure that none of you would say 100%, because yeah, that would be impressive, but not really very, very likely. Maybe a bunch of you are somewhere in that 75, 50, 25% range, probably, if you think about your current situation. Hopefully nobody says zero, seems like a flawed plan, right? But in reality, the answer is about 25%. Those 300 engineers said that about 75% of their time is spent on non-value added tasks. They're doing things that they have to do to get products out the door, to get communication accomplished, but it's not what they were hired for. Looking for information, collaborating with their counterparts, their vendors, suppliers, doing all kinds of manual calculations, building bill of materials, producing a plethora of documentation, and certainly entering and re-entering information over and over again in business system after business system. Those are all the things that you want to target when you're looking to automate processes. Process automation really covers a lot of ground. And I know some of you tuned into this WebEx to really find out, okay, tell me a little bit more. What, what are we talking about? Well, I'm gonna talk about a number of different things, but process automation could be things as little as little task automation to print this or publish that, up to controlling entire 3D design concepts, integrating business systems, tying your MRP system to your PLM system, and creating an entire system of sales tools that help the people that are out in the field for your company do a better job of selling, get more exposure, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways that you can target it. My goal is to share a lot of those, or at least a cross-section of those types of ideas with you. Okay. <clears throat> so... This first slide, and it looks like my animation isn't working real well, so I apologize for that. You don't get to see those three ovals appear dramatically. But this slide really shows the business task at hand. When you go about the process of creating or, or working towards an automated process or, or figuring out what to automate, you're looking for things that are going to create a return on investment things that will help you with top-line revenue growth, bottom-line cost savings, or help you with your quality challenges, risk mitigation. And you'll see a number of different things listed in each one of those three sections. Well, my hope is to touch on some examples that Imagine It has embarked on with customers to help them accomplish those goals. And the first group to talk about is that top-line growth things that you can do to generate more revenue, things that you can do to shorten your time to market and improve customer service. So I circled those three because my examples kind of hit on those primarily. So let's take a look. So here would be an example of sales automation. You want, a, you want a customer to be able to feel like they've designed their own product? Put them in the driver's seat. Let them be able to drag and drop components, in this case, a playground system, together and assemble the entire system like Lego blocks. Building deck here, put a roof on it there, attach a slide, attach a climbing wall, connect that to another deck, hit a button, and a great image appears so they can see the entire thing set up in their prospective environment. Hit another button, generate a bill of materials, it gets sent off to engineering for production. All of this while maintaining business issues that we need to maintain, or business rules that we need to maintain to be able to put together a product correctly. So building of sales tools is the first one I would touch on. Okay? Obviously, engineer to order is a huge thing still right now. People looking for ways to create customized deliverables of their products 
that are made to order or engineered to order to meet customer specifications. This quick example talks about an HVAC system where we're going to configure the setup and the output of this system based on each customer's needs. We're going to build it automatically once you fill in some dialogues. We're going to automatically generate all the documentation. We're going to build all the assemblies, output the bill of materials, send that off to our business system just by a user filling out this information. Takes you from something that might have been two or three days to 30 minutes or so. Those are things that can change the game in terms of your time to market. What if we took that same example and did it in reverse order? Some companies start with a bill of materials that sales or an estimator puts together. They build an updated bill of materials of the new product. Well, we can reverse engineer that bill of materials back into a complete 3D design, applying rules to it, and making sure that everything gets put together constrained properly so that I can generate all the assembly documentation that has to go out to the shop for this to get built. So you can automate in different directions depending on what you need to, to do to accomplish your goals. Okay. Let's move away from engineering. Many of you have customer service teams. Those customer service teams take issues. They take calls from customers that are having a problem, a warranty issue, a defect, something broke the day they opened the box. Hopefully not, but let's say it did happen. Right? The ability to combine that customer service interaction with the actual engineering data that's affected, share that information together automatically through a cloud connection out to remote services organizations, you can facilitate that communication. That's a selling tool, right? Obviously, it's a quality control issue as well, but there's a lot of advantage if you can streamline that process and make all of the pertinent information available to somebody that needs it to fix something that's broke. Okay, so we talked a little bit about top line growth. Now I'm kind of moving around the wheel of ROI to talk about the bottom line, different types of process automation that we can think of and process improvement ideas to change the efficiency in how your factory functions, your cost, profitability, and certainly inventory management. Let's take a look at those. All right, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about additive manufacturing. I'm a huge fan and a 3D printer owner myself. So whether your needs are for small 3D printed maintenance items for the shop or very large construction projects like you see in the lower right-hand corner there where we're actually 3D printing concrete for a home, there are applications for additive manufacturing for many people on this call. Due to the different types of resins and metals that are available, the complexity of the products that you can manufacture. There's a lot of different ways to go. It's not really an automated idea, but I included it because it is a process improvement idea that I think is pretty important, pretty big in today's age. All right, so let's talk about automation again in that cost-saving process. Let's look outside of engineering. Let's look downstream to shipping. Those of you that have to pack trucks full of your products to be delivered, you're always looking for ways to optimize that, that workflow. Right? Here's an example of a furniture manufacturer that used automation tools to create an algorithm that would automatically let them load the truck in the best manner to get the most product on it and automatically sort that in order of the delivery list so the right things are available, reducing headaches and problems within the shipping processes. Here would be an example of a company that actually builds communication towers that don't look like communication towers, similar to that steeple you'll see there in the right-hand side. But many of you are challenged with multiple processes uh, and multiple pieces of technology that you're using for those processes. I was actually on site with a customer not too far back. And he told me they had 39 different pieces of software technology that they used 
somewhere throughout their process. And in many cases, those pieces of technology don't talk to each other. So you have to keep re-entering information from your engineering system to your PLM system. And anything that sales entered in their CRM system, we got to re-enter into engineering, those types of things. Well, this is a case where the customer said, enough's enough. I've got one system that sales uses. I've got one system that my est estimators use and another that my engineers use. Let's tie them all together so that they're all feeding and getting information out of one common database. And we just keep adding to it as we move through the quoting process and the engineering process. You know, they said this is 10 times faster than when they had all the re-entry and um, redundant processes. This is a basic one that many of you on this call, I would guess, deal with. You've got CAD data in 3D, and it's you generated a lot of information about that data, but you also have a PLM system or an ERP system that controls your production. How do you get those two systems talking together? Here's an example where this customer created a bi-directional link between their vaulted CAD data and their PLM system using a product that Imagine it creates called Pulse, and it's customized to connect any two business systems so that you can get that data moving back and forth. Don't re-enter information, share it, send it back and forth as needed. Okay. Let's go a different direction again. If some of you are in the building products field, all right, perhaps you've got to send people on site to determine how products are going to fit how to lay them out within the environment for your customer. How about a tool that works on a, on a mobile device like an iPad, allows you to see the layout, move products around, get an acknowledgement that they'll work in the environment where that countertop or that refrigerated case or that door and window system is going to go, and you can instantly, from your on-site location, from that remote device, transmit and collaborate all that data back to the home office, have it update all the engineering information, speeds up the process, eliminates time. Also, if you've got the right tool on your handheld, maybe you don't need as many full CAD licenses with your engineering department, saving you money there. Okay, here's another example. This is a consulting engineering firm with Granted, very large team, hundreds of users. One of their big challenges was all the documentation they have to create and all that they have to publish and share to their contractors, their GCs, their suppliers, et cetera. Big task taking a lot of time coming out of not a manufacturing system like Inventure or AutoCAD, but Revit for the building design space. They were able to offload those tasks to the cloud, have a software tool that Imagine it creates called Clarity, basically handle all of that offline after hours, saving them thousands of hours in time that their users would have spent generating PDFs, collaborating, sending those out into the cloud and sharing them. That's all been automated for them now. And these are all things behind the scenes to lower your bottom line costs. Okay. The last one in this section that I want to talk about, what if you've got a lot of different distribution facilities or you've got a lot of locations that you sell out of, you've got a lot of product in those different locations or a lot of equipment, okay? Maybe it's hundreds of different distributors. You can instantly send all of the data regarding from each location to the cloud, back to corporate inventory management, asset management systems, so that you're keeping track of everything that's going on in your distributed network more effectively. All right, the last area to look at in this ROI wheel is quality control, risk mitigation, right? How do we improve quality in the products that we're sending out to customers? and even keep an eye on maintenance problems before they happen. So I circled a few that my examples will touch on as we go forward here. 
So let's talk about a quality control initiative. This would be a semiconductor manufacturer that lays out a large number of chips in a strip and used to have to manually determine what the best layout was for this, the most effective way to do this. Now they've got tools that run right inside of AutoCAD that they can fill in an interface, an easy to use interface, reduce the number of errors they had dramatically and the quality, the efficiency of each strip of chip components that are being created. Let's look at a different angle again. Right? Augmented reality. Maybe a lot of you are familiar with the concept of virtual reality. You know, you're creating a virtual environment to be able to see a product, great. But I think one of those things that's imperative now, if you're in a if you're in an industry like a building products manufacturer industry, you need to see how your products will actually fit and work within the actual environment itself. So you're going to blend a, a, a shot of the actual environment with digital imaging of your products, be able to do collision detection, be able to make decisions regarding what the best way to place that equipment is to avoid all the existing infrastructure that sits there. If you're in a plant, you continuously deal with maintenance, you continuously deal with swapping out motors, swapping out drives, swapping out tooling. Here you can, with, with augmented reality, you can combine a look at a machine tool, use the actual view, combine it with digital views of the equipment you might be swapping out, instantly get assembly instructions, documented gotchas as you see how it fits in there, shortening the learning curve for new employees, and making sure that maintenance gets done right the first time out in the plant. Okay. That's a, those are tools for process improvement to help speed those processes and still increase quality. Okay. Here's one more example, and, and this is really a company that, you know, that, Internet of Things is, is huge now. How can we use that? This is really Internet of Things before Internet of Things was a thing. This is a company, a manufacturer, that's installed a number of sensors on their different pieces of machinery because they want to track how the machine executes with every cycle. Right? They can keep track of when it's cycling out of whack. If there's an error on the machine, they can keep track of where exactly the machine was in its cycle when it aired out, what positions were the different arms, the different stamps, the different punch tools, different fabrication equipment, where was it? Automatically transmits that to engineering. Engineering can insert that into Inventor so that they can get a quicker read on what's going on with this piece of equipment. They can also predict when it's going to fail based on the level of variation in how those sensors are behaving. Okay, so you got a chance to see a bunch of these different areas in this ROI wheel, top line growth, bottom line impact and risk mitigation. And again, we've got hundreds of examples that would fit in all of these different sections. In the span of time we had, I tried to grab some that I thought would be interesting and would show you that it's not just about engineering. There's places to automate processes all throughout your manufacturing operation. Right. So let's segue. You might be asking now, where do I get started? I'm buying into what you're saying, Scott. I'm on board. Where should we start? Well, that's pretty easy. And this is the same thing I tell every customer that I sit down with. The first step is you have to map the process today. You're looking at a very simplified math for a scoreboard manufacturer that I worked with a while back. But the idea here is we need to see what the steps are in the process. Okay? We have to document how sales interacts, how order processing is involved, where engineering gets involved, when engineering gets involved, who's involved. How do we get approval from clients in that process? Okay. How does data go through engineering? How does it get out of engineering onto the shop? Who's involved once it gets down to the shop? 
Are there subcontractors? Are there vendors, suppliers? Where does purchasing come in? When are they involved? If you can map out that process and lay out where everybody's involved, then you can go back and look at each step and say, okay, what is wrong with our sales process today? Would, it, would there be sales automation that we can help there? When we're generating packets for the shop, what issues do we have in that step? And is there a process for automating that? When we're generating all the documentation that goes out, is there a step that we can automate that? As we look at engineering, certainly, you know, certainly as we look at engineering, we can see exactly what has to happen to get our new customized product out the door that meets customer specifications at a high level of quality. We can break that down at each step and determine which ones are going to lend themselves to automation the best. But my message here definitely is, don't just look at engineering, look at the entire process because there are opportunities for improvement all throughout. Okay? All right. So <clears throat> this is my favorite PowerPoint slide ever, and it is by no means new, but it's as relevant today as it was the day that I originally started using this. It's my favorite PowerPoint slide for a couple of reasons. One, I'm from a design engineering background, so this slide positions design engineering at the center of everything going on. I like to think that's the way it is, right? So I feel good about that. But the more important reason is that if you're looking to identify places for process automation and improvement, you need to be looking at every one of these. You need to start in engineering, certainly, and figure out which steps of your engineering process can be automated. You need to look at sales. You need to find out what steps are going on in that sales process that we can facilitate automation in. If we're sending data back and forth to suppliers and, uh, and subcontractors, how can we automate that? That's something that I don't need 50 people on my team each spending 30 minutes a day sending things to and from suppliers. What can I do to eliminate it? Purchasing. Obviously, purchasing has to be able to get the information they want from engineering, from sales, from manufacturing. What, is, what are they forced to do over and over again? Where, where do we have opportunities there? When I think of manufacturing and production control, there's a lot of quality initiatives there it can be automated. I showed you a couple examples of what people are doing. Okay. Maintenance, customer service. I showed you an example there. You know, customer service is key to grow business growth. You must treat your customers well. You've got to be responsive. It's an area of improvement for a lot of companies. And so looking at how you interact with customers from a customer service standpoint, maintenance, that's all incredibly important. Um, your IS, your infrastructure team, your IT people, how can we automate processes to give them back eight hours of time every week that today they're spending doing things with our different systems because of shortcomings, right? So my point here is you need to be examining all these different areas, you need to be looking at what generates ROI from a Top line sales growth standpoint, a bottom line cost saving standpoint, and a quality improvement standpoint. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I've spent 30 minutes there telling you a little bit about that. Um, I would be also remiss if I didn't say, imagine it's here to help. Okay. I have a team of 120 plus engineers across all engineering disciplines to help you solve these problems, to help you figure out which steps of that value mapping that you did can be automated. You know, maybe it's $10,000, maybe it's $100,000. We don't know, but we can help you understand that. We're 40 locations plus all across North America with degreed engineers in all the major disciplines from manufacturing, architecture, civil, 
entire team of 17 software developers, PLM specialists, facilities management specialists, and FEA and CFD specialists. That's what we do for a living. That's what my team is focused on. And we look for the opportunity to help you get there.